Okay. Well, here we are again. Uh, my name is David Chinnery, and I'm happy to welcome all of you here today to our talk about insects. Uh, we're calling this What's Bugging You? Garden Pests for 2020. Um, I work at Cornell Cooperative Extension of Rensselaer County, and most of you on here probably have that figured out already. We've done a bunch of these webinars and uh, lunch in the garden format here on Wednesday, so we're starting back up again. And it's nice and hot time of the year. And I wish I could say I was in air conditioning, but I'm not, but it's not too hot in my house today. So I'm doing well and I hope you're all doing well too. And thank you for joining us. Um, if you have any questions, type them in the chat box and we'll get to the uh, chat box at the end. So today I'm gonna try to go really fast because I have a lot of pictures to show you. So let's see here. Uh, we'll first just start out talking about insects in general. Uh, bugs are here, bugs are there. We find bugs everywhere. That's certainly true, especially this time of the year. And there are four to six million species of insects that comprise over 80% of the known animals. And of course, humans are only one species. There's about four million insects in the average acre in New York State. So there's a lot of bugs and people send us photographs of insects all the time wanting them identified and they have to be good clear photos because there's so many insects we really need to have a good look at them to tell what they are. So um, it's kind of a challenge and we have over 90,000 species of insects in North America. So there's a lot out there. Uh, so just a more, little more introduction here. A few facts. Uh, the majority of insects are beneficials and they're pollinators, decomposers, parasites of pests, and predators of pests. So we don't want to go around killing insects indiscriminately. Most of them are out there either helping us or they're maybe an important part of the ecological scene. So uh, there's really a relatively narrow group that are really pests. Uh, and here's an example, lady beetle. Most people know the lady beetle is a beneficial insect. It eats a lot of eggs and perhaps soft body insects um, of other species. Uh, but also the lady beetle, um, the Asian lady beetle was released as a beneficial a number of years ago. And it can actually be kind of a pest if it moves into your house in the winter in any large numbers. And the picture on the right there is the larva of the lady beetle. So it could be mostly considered good, but sometimes lady beetles can be a bit pesty. Termites on the other hand, maybe we would say, of course, they're going to be, you know, destructive and dangerous to our house and our structures. But think about termites in the natural world. They decompose things and break down wood and add to the natural recycling. So in some ways, maybe even termites have their good points. Okay, what types of damage do insects do to plants? And this is really important to get to know um, some of these uh, signs, because when you see damage on a plant, if you can characterize it, you can start to think about what kind of insect might be around. So certainly chewing of plant parts, holes in leaves, uh, flower petals chewed, sucking plant sap, we'll see pictures of that. Sometimes the plant looks stippled or wilted or twisted, uh, boring into stems, twigs, etc. You might see stems wilting again or holes in stems or trunks of trees. Cambium and leaf mining, I'll show you pictures of that where the insect is actually inside the leaf chewing around. Making galls of leaves and stems. Uh, stems and leaves might be swollen or have weird misshapen uh, marks on them. And certainly insects can vector disease pathogens, especially the sucking insects like the aphids and the thrips can take a virus from one plant and transfer it to another. And there's also beetles that move uh, fungus around. So we have insects moving diseases. Uh, oh shoot, that was today. I like that little uh, graphic there of uh, Noah's Ark, I suppose. And why I put that there? Well, timing of insect appearance and action you take is everything. Uh, you really got to be out in your garden looking all the time because insects are going to come along at certain times of the year when the weather develops and it's warm enough for them and the conditions are right. And if you're there and you see them, then you know what's causing the damage and you can take action. If you look three weeks later, it's a little hard to figure out because maybe the insects are gone and all you're left with is the plant damage and that's harder to figure out. So careful observation is key. 
be looking in your garden all the time. Be really keeping an eagle watch on your plants. And also learn to tolerate some damage. I have people sending me pictures every day of plants with holes in the leaves. Sometimes these are important plants. Sometimes they're not important plants. Uh, sometimes plants can tolerate some damage. Um, can you eat a leaf of basil that has a little hole in it? Well, probably you can. Um, you know, learn to tolerate some damage because we don't want to be spraying and worrying about everything all the time. Um, if we can tolerate a little damage, that makes life a lot, lot easier. Now, I'm not going to talk a lot about control today. We're going to mostly talk about um, insect identification and what to look for, but I just threw up a few of the common insecticides that you might see out there um, and you might be using. Insecticidal soap and horticultural oil are my two favorites. They're relatively low toxicity and low risk, easy to use. Um, you can use them and be fairly uh, confident that you're going to be safe um, and you're not going to really hurt yourself. And they're, they're not widely toxic to uh, other things like pets. Uh, neem oil also falls into that category as well as splenosid. So these are the ones that I try to go to if I'm killing things like aphids, especially uh, soft-bodied insects. If I can use one of these type products, uh, it's a lot uh, easier. There's also something called Bacillus thuringiensis or BT. It's a bacteria that we can spray onto soft-bodied larvae like some of the cabbage worms and some of the pests of vegetables. That'll be safe to use on vegetable plants. And then if we need to move up a notch, we might use resmethrin, permethrin, bifenthrin. Uh, those are some of the more modern uh, insecticides. We also have, of course, still around malathion and carbaryl, some of the hard stuff, not particularly friendly to bees and pollinators. So we don't want to use that with abandon or unnecessarily. And there's many other products out there and uh, you'll find in garden centers and, and nurseries. Of course, we always say read the label, make sure that the pesticide is going to work on your problem, and remember that the label is the law, and it should be a product that's labeled for your pest and also labeled to be safe on your plant. Uh, and these will come in liquid formulations, granulars, and dusts. But of course, we have lots of other ways to control insects. I just threw this little collage up here. Uh, we have a lady using a vacuum that might be kind of more appropriate indoors. We have those uh, row covers, that picture in the middle on the top. These are barriers of fabric you can use in a vegetable garden, especially good to block certain insects from coming in at certain times of the year. Of course, if your crop there needs pollination, you have to open that up and let the pollinators in. So they have to be used with some knowledge. Uh, our lady beetle there is our beneficial insect. We hope that those are in our gardens and we can do things like plant more uh, flowering plants that might be attractive to them. Um, our tomato plants down there have a yellow sticky card. Now you're probably not going to use that as a home gardener, but that's an aid that they use in greenhouses to monitor for insects because the insects are attracted to that yellow color. And probably the most important one for gardeners is hand picking. So we have somebody picking off a big insect there. If we can hand pick or remove maybe the worst infested leaves, cut the plant back, then we don't have to use an insecticide perhaps. And of course, we wanna think about using pest resistant plants. That's the picture of the birch tree there, the famous river birch, which is resistant to the bronze birch borer. So do your research on what plant you're gonna buy and what kind of pests it might get. Uh, get rid of infested plants. If you have a plant that's really become a problem with insects repeatedly, maybe you don't wanna grow that anymore. Maybe it's better to get rid of that and try to grow something else and shop with your eyes open. There's the woman in the nursery uh, looking at the plants. It's fun to go buy plants, but I've had a number of people this year, especially tell me tales of buying a plant and bringing it home and discovering it was covered in aphids that they didn't really look at, uh, and similar things to that. So make sure you're buying uh, plants that don't have a problem. Okay, I also like to say that everybody should have that thing uh, there, that's the hand lens that I have on an old shoelace, and I carry that around and look at the undersides of the leaves and really take a good look at my plant. So hand lenses, magnifying glasses are very important. Of course, there's lots of insect books and websites. Bugguide.net is one of my favorites. If you find an insect, you might be able to match up um, a picture there, and you can also send us a specimen 
or a photo. And I'll put my email address up there again at the end if you do want to send us one. Okay, so let's talk about the insects themselves. And we're going to have to go really fast because there's so many. I just wanted to mention that there's an incomplete life cycle where an egg starts out, hatches into a series of instars or nymphs and becomes an adult. So you might see insects that look something like this. This is an example of a true bug developing. And you can see the little guys have six legs and two antenna and three body parts, just like the adults. Or we also have a complete life cycle. And these are characterized by beetles in this picture, where we have an egg, a larva, in this case, we call it a grub, a pupa, and then an, an adult uh, beetle. So you're gonna see all sorts of life forms out there. And if you can think about, does it have six legs? Does it look like a caterpillar? Does it look like a, a larva? Um, is it not moving? Maybe it's a pupa. This is kind of uh, the start of trying to learn how to identify some of these insects. Okay, so let's start out talking about uh, these insects in groups. And my first group here is called Hemiptera, or the true bugs. Now, if we were in a classroom here, I would say, what type of damage do true bugs do? And somebody hopefully would say, bugs suck. So always remember, true bugs suck the sap of your plants. So you're not gonna see leaf feeding. You're not gonna see holes in leaves with true bugs. You're gonna see maybe wilting, uh, stippling, off-color foliage, bronzing, that sort of thing if you have a bug infestation. So this is a Western con for seed bug. This is not a pest of garden plants, but he moves into your house uh, in the late fall and winter and becomes one of those indoor pests. So not a problem on plants, but something we find inside. And you can see his six legs, two big antenna, and he's got sucking mouth parts. So in the garden, uh, we had a lot of questions this spring about this guy, the four-lined plant bug, a little yellow and black bug. And this guy sucks the juice out of perennial plants and maybe some shrubs. And you can see it's got sort of a that leaf there has sort of a blackening to it. There aren't holes in the leaf, but the bug is sucking the juice out of that leaf and causing that stippling or that discoloration. Um, I have these on Coreopsis in my garden. Now they're gone this time of the year. They come about in the spring, May, June, and then they seem to disappear. But if you've got this kind of damage, you might have had four lined plant bugs earlier on. Uh, these guys come along now in the high summer. Squash bugs are going to feed on plants in the cucurbit family. Um, I've had these really bad on my wall from butternut squash I grow every year. And you can see there's a number of different life stages there. There's lots of nymphs of different sizes. And then the adult is the darker gray beetle. So those are sucking the juice out of the squash plant. And again, you might use an insecticidal soap on that and knock them back. Uh, hopefully you could get some good control with one of those softer materials. But look, it's on the underside of the leaf there. So always turn your leaf over and take a look underneath. And you've got a big population there. Somebody wasn't paying attention when there was just a few of them. Uh, stink bugs, similar kind of damage. Uh, we get questions about these once in a while on tomatoes. You can see the adult there is green. But then the younger nymphal stages are very colorful. And you wouldn't necessarily think that that colorful guy grows up to be the plain green guy, but yeah, that's what they do. So sometimes it's really tricky to do identification and you've got to be prepared to see uh, some color variations on the same insect. Now, one that probably almost everybody knows is the brown marmorated stink bug, but we'll touch upon him for a second. Uh, they've moved up from the south to our area in the past maybe seven or eight years, I guess. It's kind of a shield-shaped bug brown in color, and in the summertime, they can stick their mouth part into a developing apple or a peach or a cherry tomato and suck the juice out, and it causes discoloration and destruction of the cells on the fruit. So farm people, uh, growers, have more problem with these than home gardeners, but you might see some damage of this, uh, on this type uh, in a home garden as well. And again, this graphic again shows how it changes color. The number two there, they look like ping pong balls. They're tiny little eggs. They hatch into number three, four, five, six, seven, and then number one really should be number eight, I think, up at the top. But you can see they change color. They change shape a little bit as they develop. Um, so be on the lookout for different uh, forms of this kind of an insect. Uh, one of my favorites I'll just touch upon briefly 
uh, which can kill lawns, and we'll start to see this coming up now. July, especially August and September, is the chinch bug. So large areas of lawn dying here. It's not drought and it's not rubs, which we'll talk about in a minute. But if we were to look very closely, we might find these tiny little chinch bugs. These are, I think, are uh, 3 16 of an inch, if I'm not mistaken, if I have my number right. You can see there's kind of an X on the back. And again, they're sucking the juice out of the grass blades. They build up in a large population. There's two generations per year and people's lawns brown out and they die uh, in the late summer. And if you were thinking it's scrubs, you would be wrong. And this year it could be drought damage, but um, you would be wrong as well. You have chinch bugs. So these guys are actually worse in hot, dry years. So I'm expecting we're gonna see quite a few of these coming up. And one of my favorite things is the chinch bug detection device. This is a little trick. If you think you have your lawn has chinch bugs, you take a cylinder, uh, such as this, or a bucket that doesn't have a bottom in it, you shimmy it down into the ground and you pour water in there, and the chinch bugs will float to the surface. Or a little bit easier method really is to cut a square out of your lawn, put it in a bucket of water, and the chinch bugs will float up. Now they're really tiny, you're going to maybe need to see uh, them with a magnifying glass. And uh, if you've got, oh, you know, a fair population in there, if you're seeing a dozen or more probably in a small sample, you have a chinch bug issue. Okay, a few more bugs. Uh, the box elder bugs doesn't really affect plants that are um, highly favored by gardeners, but occasionally we have these moving into houses in the colder weather again, or once in a while these will be covering shrubs. I've had questions about these on azaleas. They don't tend to do a lot of plant damage um, on things other than box elder, and most people don't really grow box elder. It's a tree that might be living in the wild. Um, other sucking insects, we move into aphids. Of course, these are very, very prolific this time of the year. Um, there's green aphids, black aphids, red aphids, any color you want, orange aphids. They suck a lot of juice out of the leaves and they will be on lots of different plants. I've had aphids on some of my perennials this year that I've never really had trouble with in the past. So look on the undersides of the leaves and the tender shoots and they'll build up in these very large populations. Uh, female aphids don't need to have the company of a male, let's say, in order to produce offspring. They can just do that on their own. So there's a lot of aphids um, out there. And again, insecticidal soap, uh, horticultural oil, some of those materials will usually take care of aphids pretty well. But be on the lookout for them because they really build up in very large populations quickly. Uh, just a note on the hemlock situation. We have hemlock trees in Rensselaer County and we do have the hemlock woolly adelgid. It's an aphid-like creature. It's white and fuzzy. It sucks the juice out of hemlock trees. And the picture there was taken in the uh, southern Appalachians where it's killing just, you know, millions of hemlock trees. So be on the lookout for these. My neighbor's hemlock next door to me is now infested with hemlock woolly adelgid. So if you own any hemlocks, really go out and take a look at your trees. Here's one in Castleton down the road from me that's being infested and this tree will die from those uh, adelgids. Uh, here's another one. This is similar to an aphid as well. This is on spruces. This is called eastern spruce gall adelgid and what this does is it sucks the juice out of the developing shoot on a spruce tree and it makes the spruce tree swell up and you get almost these pineapple-like galls that form on the tree and then those needles beyond the gall out on the tip of the branch are going to die. And if you have enough of these eastern spruce gall adelgids on your spruce tree, your tree will look really poor and really ratty. Now this is one that we need to follow specific timing on spraying for it and you're going to need some, to use some of the more serious pesticides to control this. I won't go into any of those details but do check your spruce trees for this because this will be a problem uh, that's common in our area. And another one that's really important to watch out for, I can't emphasize this enough, if you have magnolias. Uh, magnolias can get a scale insect. Now scale insects tend to look lumpy, they can be brown, they can be white depending on their type and their season of the year, but they're lumps that are sitting there sucking the juice out of your twigs of your magnolia, and I have seen large magnolias die from this in a couple seasons if not treated. So you've really got to stay on uh, the ball with magnolia in this area because um, they can be 
really problematic. Oh, Mel, if you have a question, just type it in the box and we'll, we'll get there. Okay, uh, a, a person sent this in a couple weeks ago. They were wondering why their lilac didn't look so good. And this was white prunicola scale covering this lilac. It looks like, I don't know, it's got, you know, uh, white something or other, uh, white co confectionery sugar all over it. So this is scale, again, sucking the juice out of that lilac. That will die if it's not treated, okay? And here's just a panoply of other scales, oyster shell scale, brown, elm scale, or European fruit, mecanium scale, uh, pine needle scale, pines, especially the two-needled pines like the um, uh, mugo pine can get very bad infestations, infestations of scale. And these guys, again, they don't move a whole lot through most of their life cycle. They're just settled down there and they're sucking out the juice of the plant. And all of these sucking insects can make what's called sooty mold. What happens is that they excrete excess moisture and sugar out of their bodies as they feed on the plant. This falls down on the leaves or surfaces below where they're feeding. This could be on your picnic table, your patio furniture, your car, uh, your, your poodle, whoever. And then mold grows on this sticky material and we call that sooty mold. So if you're seeing sooty mold, you might have some sort of a sucking insect problem. Okay, and one just to keep a look out for, the spider and lanternfly. We won't talk about this too much today. It's, that was found in our area, but not in great degree yet. It's coming from the south, and this is a very bad true bug that's moving into the area. It's got very colorful conformation. You can see the different nymphal stages. Some are red, some are black and white. The adult looks more like a moth than a fly. It's kind of a crazy thing, but be on the lookout for this guy because we want to know if it moves into our area in any large numbers. Okay, uh, moving on from the bugs, well, let's go to thrips. Now, thrips are very, very tiny. These are going to be really even hard to see with a magnifying glass, and you can see this is a picture of the underside of a leaf here. They're tiny little rasping, sucking insects and they're gonna distort flowers or they're gonna cause modeling of leaves. And what happens is often in greenhouses, they have a thrips problem and you bring home a plant that has thrips from the greenhouse. And the most common one is called Western flower thrips. And you can see there's some leaves there. They have kind of a weird modeled pattern or that Gerber daisy uh, flower is all distorted and stunted. That's because thrips were feeding on the buds earlier. So you'd have to, again, have really good eyesight, which I'm starting to lack now in my middle age or late middle age, and uh, you have to have a magnifying glass to see these. So you'd look for buds and you'd look for uh, the underside of leaves to see if you had thrips. Daylilies can get thrips quite badly, and if you have a lot of daylilies like I do, you might see some of the buds with these funny little bumps on them, almost like warts. And that's a thrips infestation, and it's caused that daylily flower there to be uh, all mottled and discolored. Hard to control. I don't know that we're going to go around and really manage thrips. If I had a patio plant, a bedding plant, a potted plant, a container plant, and I discovered it had thrips on it, I'd probably just throw it out because it would be too hard to try to treat it and get rid of it. Uh, sugar maple trees, occasionally we call about this. Uh, they get thrips and leaves can be all twisted and discolored on sugar maple, as well as uh, privet. Now, I used to have a privet hedge. I always thought it was rather indestructible, but over time, I had a population of privet thrips move in, and you can see the leaves here on the privet are all discolored. They're almost what I call stippled or, or kind of spotted, and every summer, we would have this huge population of thrips develop on the privet, um, I eventually got rid of the privet hedge because I didn't like pruning it all the time. It was starting to really die back and didn't look good, so I replaced it with other plants. So privet can have its uh, share of problems, even though we might think it's a very indestructible plant. Okay, let's move on to the beetles and weevils. Now, this is one of our big, big groups of insects, of course. Uh, but many are not harmful, or many are actually beneficial. Brown beetle uh, and the rove beetle in these pictures here are actually beetles that feed on other insects. 
So if you see big black beetles in the soil, well, they could be ground beetles. You might want to try to identify them uh, because sometimes those are good guys. Okay, but we'll talk about some of the bad guys here. And the first one here is called white pine weevil. Now a weevil, I like to say, is just a beetle with a big snout. And you can see the picture of the insect there with its six legs and its three body parts. He's got a giant snout on that one end with two little kind of crooked antenna there. And this is a really an insect that's pretty interesting. These attack spruce trees as well as pine trees, uh, especially white pine. They fly up to the top of the tree. They lay eggs in the very early spring, usually April. And those eggs hatch, they bore into the top of that tree and they kill the top shoots of the tree. So you can see this white pine. It's a young tree, it's growing quickly, but the top is all killed out. And when you remove the leader of a conifer like this, it's gonna turn more round in shape and not be pointy and tall like it should be. Not an easy one to control. There used to be a spray you could use. We no longer have that available to us. So um, it's very unfortunate that this is around. And it also makes very twisted uh, trees that are not gonna make good lumber 100 years from now. So the lumber folks or the woodlot folks don't like white pine weevil as well. So it does cause quite a few problems for us. Um, another weevil on rhododendron especially is black vine weevil. This one lays eggs in the soil. Um, it flies up into the foliage of something like a rhododendron and it chews these classic notches out of the leaves. The larva pictured there will also feed on the root system. So if you have a rhododendron, it's starting to have a lot of these notches in the leaves on the edges of the leaves you might have a black vine weevil problem. And again, that's not an easy one to manage. You're not gonna spray insecticidal soap on that and make it go away. Uh, we would have to get a recommendation for one of the more powerful insecticides. Unfortunately, probably treat the soil to uh, get rid of that larva, although there is a treatment for the, the foliage as well. So watch for that on a rhododendron especially. Um, that can also be on yews, and it's called taxus weevil. Okay, another terrible destructive insect is the bronze birch borer. This is why it's hard to grow white barked birches in our part of the world. This insect will fly up to the top of the tree again, bore into the top of the tree, and the larva feed under the bark and disturb the cambium system. So the water and the sugar can't move up and down in the tree, and the tree will eventually look very uh, poorly and die back and uh, it's because of this bronze birch borer. So here's some pictures you can see, a uh, good old Abe Lincoln there on the penny. This insect is pretty small. Uh, the larva is quite a bit bigger. Um, it's a kind of a shiny dark insect, and it, you can see the picture up in the corner there is the burrowing or tunneling underneath the bark. So the way to get around that, of course, we just mentioned was to grow the uh, Heritage River birch, which is resistant uh, because it's hard to spray for this one and um, it's really reduced the number of birch trees we can grow successfully here, unfortunately. But the Heritage River birch is one that's resistant. It's a beautiful tree, and we recommend that one. Uh, there's lots of other boring insects. Hopefully I'm not a boring speaker. I'm not so sure about that, but these guys are very destructive. The one up in the right-hand corner, Asian longhorn beetle, we've probably all heard about that. That's a big black and white spotted beetle that's been found in numerous parts of the United States. They've spent millions and millions of dollars getting rid of that because it destroys lots of different types of trees. We don't have that here locally. It's been found in New York City though, Long Island, New Jersey, Worcester, Massachusetts. So keep on the lookout for something like that. We just had somebody yesterday send us a picture of something similar. It turned out to be a non-destructive Sawyer beetle, but it looks very similar to the Asian longhorn beetle. So I was glad to get that picture and, and make sure that we identified it correctly. Um, on the left, we have pine bark beetles. These guys are very, very tiny, but they can bore into pine trees and cause quite a bit of destruction. There's a population of those moving up from the south. They're now into the pine trees that are in the Shongo Mountains in New York State, and they're also on Cape Cod. They're on Long Island at the Pine Barrens there. They're going to be very bad. So we want to look for those, keep a lookout on your pines for those. 
Uh, the emerald ash borer, mm, that's a green insect we've talked a lot about. I'll show you another picture after this about that guy. He's killing the ash trees in Rensselaer County in the whole capital district. Very prominent this summer. We can drive around and see lots of ash trees in trouble. Um, if you have an ash tree that you want to save and it doesn't have this insect now, I would definitely look into doing the insecticide injection, which is very, very important for that. And then the big beetle on the bottom there, that guy is probably mm, two inches long. He's huge. The tile horn praeonis beetle, one of my favorites, that beetle actually eats the roots off trees. And we've had crab apple trees as well as pine trees die. And we've actually been able to track it back to that tile horn praeonis beetle. The larva is a huge grub and it eats the roots off of trees. Not easy to control by any means. And just a picture, if nobody's seen ash trees dying back, here they are at Hannaford in East Greenbush. These trees are all gone now, but a very common site being killed by the emerald ash borer. And here's the emerald ash borer larva. It's a very large larva and it gets under that bark and destroys the cambial layer. Okay, uh, in your vegetable garden, you might see these beetles, the striped cucumber beetle and the spotted cucumber beetle, very similar and they're eating the foliage on the cucurbit plant. So if your squash plant, your cucumber plant has holes uh, in the foliage, you might have a population of these. Um, again, I would probably try insecticidal soap on them. I haven't really had too much problem with these personally, but I would start there and see if I could manage them that way. Um, I have had the flea beetles, and we've gotten a bunch of calls about these this summer. There's several species of flea beetles. These can jump like fleas. And these guys attack a wide range of crops. I usually think of them being an eggplant problem. So if you're growing eggplant, and that picture in the right-hand corner is an uh, eggplant with flea beetle damage, you've got not always holes. It's like they eat one layer of the leaf, and you get brown spots, which can actually fall out and become holes. Uh, you might have flea beetles. And that bottom picture is a leaf of a brassica, maybe a um, cabbage or something like that with flea beetle damage. And then the bottom left picture is kind of interesting. They've planted mustard as a trap crop. So you plant the mustard early, the flea beetles go into the mustard because it's the tallest plant in the garden and they like it. And then you can grow your cash crop of your uh, brassicas there without so many flea beetles. So you might use row covers. You'd have to really start looking for these early in the season and know you have a history of flea beetles in your area in order to manage them. Um, another one we've gotten questions about this year, of course, the golden tortoise beetle and the clavet tortoise beetle. These are really weird looking beetles. The one is very gold. The other one looks kind of like a turtle, I suppose. And these like to eat holes in things like uh, morning glories. Uh, and sweet potato vines. So if you have holes in those plants, you might have one of these beetles, uh, very common. And actually there's not a lot of good control information about these. Um, you might start out trying to use insecticidal soap on these, but you might actually have to use something a little bit stronger because I think these are pretty tough pests to deal with. Uh, so those are kind of interesting. And again, look very carefully because these are really small. And anybody that's tried to grow lilies in our area has come across the lily leaf beetle. These do not attack day lilies, but they attack the true lilies. And they're a very attractive red beetle. They'll be in large numbers. The larva, as you can see in the upper left picture there, likes to carry around its own poop, I'll say the word, as it moves about and it feeds on the buds and the leaves. And it's really a defensive mechanism, I suppose, that. Maybe it thinks the birds don't want to eat it if it's covered in its own poop. It's not very attractive to me, at least. Um, and these are really becoming uh, very prolific, hard to grow lilies in our area now. You can try hand picking. Um, there's been projects to release, release some natural enemies of these um, in, over in New England. And I think they've done some, some good work with that. So uh, if you've got lilies and you have the lily leaf beetle, take a look at some of that information. I think it came from Connecticut. There was a study where they were releasing some beneficial insects for these guys. Uh, asparagus beetle, if you grow asparagus, you want to look for the common and the spotted asparagus beetles. They can be confused with the uh, other lady beetles or ladybugs down there on the bottom corner. But these really like asparagus plants. They'll eat the ferny part 
as well as the spear early on. And our friend and master gardener, Doug Pratt, sent us these pictures here um, of feeding in his garden. You can see that's a picture of the spear or the stem where the asparagus beetles are eating through the various uh, layers of the plant, as well as the eggs, which kind of stick out and they're kind of these uh, elongated black things. But if you grow asparagus, get to know this because you're going to have this as, a, as an issue. Uh, you're going to really want to control it because they can kill asparagus plants eventually. The viburnum leaf beetle, of course, was moved into our area probably, oh, a good 15 years ago now and eats only certain viburnums, especially the American cranberry bush viburnum and the arrowwood viburnum. Um, these have really been destroyed uh, in our area. But the good news is you can still grow other viburnums. I have leather leaf viburnum and double file viburnum. Those are resistant. So again, in this case, we can grow resistant plants. Uh, this guy will really eat a lot of the foliage on the plant. And if it does that for two or three years, the plant will probably really die back and look terrible. Uh, that's a nice picture in the upper right hand corner of the brown beetle. Not very attractive or descriptive there but they also feed. So the larvae are eating as well as the beetle. I think there's only one generation per year, but since both the beetle and the larva are both feeding, they can do quite a bit of damage. So keep an eye on your susceptible viburnums. And if you're gonna buy a viburnum, make sure you're buying a resistant viburnum. Okay, just one note here. Well, a couple more, couple more than one picture, but I just, of course, have to talk about grubs. Oh, my phone is ringing, sorry about that. But here we are in different parts of uh, Rensselaer County and we've got a lot of feeding on lawns. These pictures were taken, the top two were taken in the early spring, but the bottom were taken in the summer. And you can see there's a lot of dieback of the lawns and these are grubs that are feeding. And of course the grubs are C-shaped. They have six legs on the front end. They have a brown head capsule and they'll crawl through the soil and feed on the roots of the plants. So. Uh, if you get a large population of grubs, you can lose a lot of your lawn. And once you lose your lawn, then the crabgrass moves in and you've got bare spots and you've got soil erosion. And people spend a lot of money treating lawns for grubs. Now, it's always important to know that you have grubs before you do that. Um, but if you have a large grub population, you might really wanna think about um, investigating it. Of course, the adults here are beetles and one type is the Japanese beetle. There's a nice picture of it there. It's bronze and dark green. Uh, of course, they feed on a lot of other plants like cannas and willows and a lot of ornamentals. So you'll know if you have those guys around. They're active right now and we're seeing them flying and, and doing a lot of feeding damage. But also there's a few other ones that people are a little less aware of. This guy is called the Oriental Beetle. They're kind of a beige color with two um, black spots up on the thorax there. And these will be active right now as well. Um, they'll feed on roots of plants and cause a lot of destruction of lawns as well. And the other one that's kind of a medium brown beetle, a very large one, is called the European chafer beetle. And these again will do a lot of lawn damage, uh, but this guy doesn't really feed on ornamental plants so much. So you won't see damage from him um, on your cannas or your roses, but you'll see this one feeding on the, the lawn grasses. So here's my famous picture of the old grub life cycle. And if we look at where we are right now in July, which is almost in the middle of the picture there, the mom beetles are flying around and they're gonna be very soon laying eggs in August, which are gonna hatch into the next generation of grubs. So that means in August and September, we wanna take a look around. We might wanna dig a couple of holes in our lawn if we have brown spots appearing and make sure that we don't have the larva of uh, the beetles down there as the grubs doing the feeding. Of course, those overwinter down in the soil, they feed a little bit in April, again, when they come up and then they become the beetles that we have right now. Um, we do have a new thing, and this is why I wanted to mention this whole uh, spiel here. There's a new BT, which is a natural uh, biological control agent, considered organic, uh, Bacillus thuringiensis variety galeriae, which is gonna be something you can put on your lawn and it will kill these grubs. Now it's only been out a couple of years, it's called uh, Grub Gone, Grub, G-R-U-B, and then G-O-N-E in capital letters. Uh, that's how I've seen it marketed. Um, so it's gonna be a bacteria, the grub eats it and it acts as a stomach poison. They stop eating it and 
a few hours and they might not die for a few days. So hopefully people are going to find this uh, probably mail order. I don't know that you're going to find it in stores. But if you do have a grub problem, this is a way to not use chemicals and try to control these grubs. And probably the timing on applying this would be about now. So if you had a history of grubs in a lawn, you might want to look for this uh, new bacillus called Grub Gone and see if you uh, can get that to work. If you want to know more about grubs, this is a great website, grubid.cals.cornell.edu, or you can just Google grub ID key Cornell, and it will walk you through how to identify your grubs. It's got a lot of great pictures. This fella here, um, Dr. Wickings, Kyle Wickings, a really great guy at Cornell, has put this together and uh, wants people to learn how to identify their grubs because he's a very enthusiastic entomologist and uh, interested in teaching people this sort of thing. So if you want to learn more about grubs, Google that one. And of course, if we find that we have a lot of damage from moles, birds, skunks, led around by small boys, seagulls, we might look in our lawn to see if they are um, actually grubs there and that might be part of the problem. And this is just what you might don't want to do in the end of August and September. Take a sample out of your lawn and paw through it and look to see if you can find those tiny first instar grubs there um, and that might be part of the problem. Okay, so enough about grubs. Let's move on to another group, the Hymenoptera bees, wasps, and sawflies. There's only a couple here I want to talk about. Um, this is a red-headed pine sawfly. Kind of a beautiful larva here of a fly, a sawfly would be the adult, and it's feeding on a conifer. So if you see conifers losing their needles, it could be one of these sawflies. And the most important one I think in our area is this one called European pine sawfly. You're going to see, or maybe you've seen a little bit earlier in the season, it's probably past at this point. But that picture up in the left hand corner, there's a mass of these larvae. They can be green or they can be kind of a brownish red color. And they'll be feeding on a two needled pine, such as like a mugo pine, one of these small ornamental uh, conifers that we might have in a landscape. And the cool thing about these is when you approach them, they rear up on their hind legs and wave at you as if to frighten you away. So you definitely want to control these if you had these on a pine because uh, they can really cause quite a bit of damage. Um, another one that's bad on birch trees would be the birch leaf miner. You can see the pictures there of the birch tree with the blotchy kind of patterns in the leaves. And this would be a larva that's inside the leaf and mining around and causing the cambium to disappear in the leaf. And then the tree looks very unthrifty, the leaves fall off and turn brown and look very uh, ugly. So birch leaf miner, again, is kind of a hard one to control. We would probably have to use a systemic insecticide for that, which is not particularly um, the easiest or best thing to do. So birch leaf miner is a tough one. Uh, and this one, we've gotten a lot of questions about this year. This is called beet leaf miner and spinach leaf miner. And these will be on beets, spinach, and as well as Swiss chard. And this is a little larva, again, that gets into those leaves of those plants, feeds in there, and I get quite, I've gotten, in fact, a question this morning about why are these beet plants dying? They look like they're drying up. Well, they're not really drying up. They've got these tiny little larvae inside the leaf that are tunneling around and feeding, and then the beet is going to die, probably before it really forms a good um, edible crop there. Uh, you certainly could still eat it if it's, you know, worth eating. Uh, the larva is probably not going to be there to hurt you because it's really uh, confined to the leaves. But it does cause the plants to look really bad. You wouldn't want to eat chard that looked like that, I don't think. And uh, there's three to four generations per season. Uh, one on roses we get questions about. If your rose plant has damage, that's not really holes in the leaves, but kind of this feeding on the leaf surface. That's probably the rose slug. It's very common. Uh, insect. And again, the adult is a sawfly. It's that fancy looking guy down in the bottom left hand corner. There's at least three different species and one to six generations per year. So all of your roses can probably have this rose slug throughout the season. If there's a little bit, you can tolerate that. But I've seen some roses really defoliated by rose slug and you would have to spray something on those. Uh, gypsy moth, luckily we don't have too many of these here this year, so I'll kind of skip over them. Other parts of the state, though, we're seeing quite a few gypsy moths, and they really defoliate trees to a large degree. 
Um, there's the larva up in the right hand corner. It's a very fuzzy or hairy, spiky looking larva with uh, orangey and blue spots. And then of course the fuzzy uh, egg mass there on the left hand side. So luckily I don't, haven't heard of too many of these in Rensselaer County. Other parts of the state though are seeing quite a bit of gypsy moth damage. Luckily we have some natural enemies, bacteria and fungi that will kill these but they're not always in the right proportion to the gypsy moths, and sometimes we do have some forest damage or tree damage from those. Uh, one we see very occasionally on arborvitae. If you still have arborvitae that the deer haven't eaten, you might have dieback of the tips of the arborvitae, and inside there's a tiny larva, the arborvitae leaf miner. You have to use a razor blade and cut it open, and I've been able to uh, isolate these guys they feed inside the arborvitae. Not another easy one to control either. And another hard one is the squash vine borer. This is again, another soft flight type of critter. It bores into the stems of squash plants like zucchini, um, some of the other uh, summer squashes and so forth. And this will cause the plant to suddenly wilt and collapse. So we get a lot of people that can't grow zucchini anymore. It's really kind of sad because zucchini used to be the easiest thing to grow. You plant it and just stand back and you'd have a million zucchinis in a few weeks, but the squash vine borer has really caused a lot of problems with that. Um, here's some pictures of frass, which is just the result of the tunneling and the pooping of the insect inside the zucchini plant and the zucchini plant wilting there. Um, not easy to manage. I've grown zucchini under row covers, which is kind of a cool thing because you exclude the um, the uh, borer from, from being in there by using the cover on the crop, uh, but you have to grow parthenocarpic uh, zucchini or ones that don't need pollination. So I think on our website, we have a fact sheet about that, or if anybody's interested in that, I can get you the fact sheet about that. Um, we do have some good information about managing this one. Um, if you've got cabbage, you've probably got cabbage looper. So that's an adult moth, as well as a, a larva that's green here, eating holes in the cabbage. And its cousin would be cabbage moth, or very similar. There's a number of different species here, but they really do kind of similar damage in that they eat enough of the foliage there that the crop isn't really attractive and you don't want to eat it. The good thing here would be that that BT, again, Bacillus thuringiensis, might be one of the ways, ones you can try here to control this, and that's a biological agent and would be considered organic. But again, you got to start early in the season. Once it gets to this point, a lot of the damage is done, so be on the lookout for this early and take action. Uh, you can see that picture of the worm there that Doug took. It's hard to see these guys. It's very easy to ignore these uh, and not really find them if you're uh, not looking very carefully. So we need close observation, hand picking, again, the BT or maybe a row cover as well here because we don't really need to pollinate these crops. And the tomato hornworm, it's tomato season. I just picked my first tomatoes this uh, yesterday. And uh, this is a guy that will eat a lot of the foliage on a tomato plant. This is a giant larva. You can see several inches long, green, it blends in. It's perfectly camouflaged on the tomato plant. But what you're gonna see is a tomato plant like this one here that doesn't have any leaves left. <laughs> and it's not gonna be deer damage. You're gonna see uh, this disappearing before your eyes. And if you're really lucky, underneath the plant, you might see the poop. I had a friend one time growing tomato plants in big wine barrels on her deck. And she asked me to come over and take a look at this weird thing under the plants. And it was all this poop. She didn't even notice the leaves were gone on the plant. But the tomato hornworms had eaten all the leaves off the plant. She didn't notice that, but she noticed the poop underneath, which was kind of fun. Um, so look for these. You can handpick them, certainly. Um, BT would control these as well, uh, but handpicking is probably the way you want to go on this one. And if you see these pupa of the wasp, Cotesia congregata, sticking out, that's a parasite of that hornworm there, and you can um, leave those. If you leave that, that will help that wasp propagate. That's, again, a natural enemy. We want to help those wasps along. And they come along and sometimes they parasitize these tomato hormones, sometimes they don't, they don't. So I think it was Monday, I had a whole conversation with a gentleman about this, saying if it looks like the one on the left, go ahead and kill that, squash that one, get rid of it however you want to get rid of it. But if it looks like the one on the right with the little white sticks 
or the little white tic tacs sticking out, uh, leave it alone because those wasps are there and we want them to propagate. And the adult, interestingly enough, is called a five spotted hawk moth. Cutworms, another interesting uh, destructive insect in a vegetable garden, especially earlier in the spring. Cutworm season kind of pass unless you're putting out new plants because this is what they want to do. They want to mow down your new seedlings. You can see these pictures here are very graphic. This larva comes out of the soil. It feeds at night. It will cut down seedlings and destroy some of the small leaves and uh, the smaller plants. There's lots of different species of these. Uh, people go to great lengths to protect their plants. They make cutworm collars sometimes. Um, if this is in turf, we mow turf at 3 a.m. to kill the cutworms because they're feeding at night. So if you're seeing plants disappearing or mowed down, you might have this cutworm problem. Uh, now one I won't spend too much time on is this very important one called the spotted winged fruit fly or spotted winged drosophila. This is primarily a problem for people that grow berries. If you're growing strawberries, blueberries, raspberries, uh, those very soft fruit crops, and they're rotting early, or you're seeing the berries disintegrate or become mushy, right when you pick them or before you pick them when they're on the plant, you might have trouble with the spotted wing fruit fly. This moved into our area a number of, just a few years ago. Um, it causes a lot of damage on fruit crops. It makes holes in the berry as it's developing and deposits eggs. So if you looked at those berries that were disintegrating, you would see larva developing in them. Totally, totally disgusting. So our fruit growers have had a lot of trouble with this and go to great lengths to try to deal with this. It's been a big issue in the Hudson Valley. Uh, boxwood, if you have any boxwood, you might know the boxwood leaf miner. This was a bad one this spring. I saw a number of cases of boxwood leaf miner. It's a little larva that tunnels around inside the leaf. You'll see this feeding early in the spring. The leaves uh, look very uh, brown, fall off. Um, there are a couple insecticides you can use um, early on and then that will manage this one pretty well. And then this one was one I didn't really know, but I think it's important. Uh, Doug Pratt sent me these pictures of bean seed maggot or seed corn maggot. This is a little fly that lays a larva, and the larva will feed on um, cotyledons, stems, roots of new seedlings. So this, again, is going to be one you probably see mostly in the spring. And if your seedlings in your vegetable garden are damaged or disappearing, you might want to look for these tiny larvae that are feeding on these young plants or just the seeds as they're, they're just starting to grow. So, this is a case where I would say, you know, probably we've been wrong about certain things. You know, people will say, why did my seeds in my garden not germinate? Well, we'd say, oh, well, maybe they rotted. And that could very well be, but you might actually have a problem with this seed, uh, seed corn maggot or this bean seed maggot, which is a fly as an adult. So that would be a great one to learn about if you're having trouble with seeds in your vegetable garden in the spring. And Doug here gave us a picture of germinating now, I think those might be bean seeds on a paper towel to get them started and then planting them and trying to see if that worked out better. All right, so let's wrap up here and talk about mites. Now, mites aren't insects, but we're going to talk about them anyway because they're in our gardens and uh, very important creatures. Very, very tiny. And you can see these are two good pictures of the damage that mites often do. I call it stippling or bronzing damage. Okay, so mites are very tiny. They suck on plant sap. Uh, the leaves become discolored in gray or bronze. They might drop off prematurely. And certain plants can die from mites um, or become very injured. Mites have eight legs. That's not always true. There's sometimes when they have six legs, but let's say mites have eight legs just to make things simple right now. Uh, the eggs are large compared to the mite itself. They like Hot weather, uh, some types of them like hot weather, some of them like cool weather. They all, all like dry weather. So I think we're gonna have a lot of mite damage in the next say six or eight weeks as the summer progresses when the populations build up quickly. And again, you wanna check the underside of the leaf. So flip the leaf over and get out your hand lens because you're gonna look very, very closely uh, for these little mites. So here's some really great pictures of spider mites. Now spider mites will cause webbing as well as this 
discoloration of the foliage. Um, and if you get spider mites on things like phlox, um, ivy that we had a picture of, we've seen spider mites on, um, uh, trying to think of what was that, uh, I was going to say cannabis, but it wasn't cannabis. What's the other stuff people want to grow? Uh, hops. Hops will get a lot of mite damage. Um, spruce trees will get a lot of mite damage. A lot of different plants will have high populations of mites. So again, look very closely with a hand lens. Uh, the interesting picture down there on the bottom, that big black blob, is a lady beetle eating mites. So there are natural enemies of these mites, but they often don't keep up. And here's a picture of a spruce tree covered in spruce spider mite. Okay, other crops here, an oak leaf, another green leaf, and again, there's the cannabis. That's maybe why I said that. Uh, covered in spider mites, I'm sure none of you are growing that. Uh, here's arborvitae, very close up, and you can see on the left side, down towards the bottom there, there's some brown, orange color, kind of dots. Those are mite eggs. So arborvitae can be severely infested by mites. Okay, here I went down to the Castleton Post Office. They have one of those dwarf Alberta spruce trees, and it's got a very bad case of mites. So this plant, dwarf Alberta spruce, will often get mites and really can be killed in just a season or two from that. So be on the lookout for mites. Um, if you think you've got mites, one way to tell would be to either get your hand lens out, like I said, or put a branch over a clean white piece of paper, tap the branch, you'll get some dirt on it. And if you slam your hand down on that white paper and smear it, and you have bloody smears, you're gonna know that you have mites. Uh, a cousin to the regular old mites are these areophyid mites. Um, a friend of mine sent me these pictures from Steventown. What's wrong with the apple tree? What's wrong with the apple foliage? Well, we didn't have the actual sample, but we think these are areophyid mites. Now, this is an insect that we need an electro microscope to take a picture of. So here's a picture. I didn't take that. We stole that picture from the USDA because these guys are really hard to see, probably not visible, visible with a hand lens because they're one one hundredth of an inch. They have two pairs of legs instead of four. They can cause galls, blisters, bronzing of foliage, and they might transmit diseases. So sometimes if we can't find something, it's because we can't even see it because of the magnification of what we have is not good enough. So know that there's even tinier things than mites on plants, and they're very, very hard to see. And one of those groups is called the areophyid mites. And these are important. We do see uh, occasions where we think this has, these ha uh, areophyid mites are around, even though they're very hard to identify. Well, we went for just an hour, and I hope that wasn't too long for anybody. Um, I want to say thank you for watching. And here's my email address, dhc3 at cornell.edu. If you have any questions, uh, send me uh, an email. If you've got insect pictures, I love to see insect pictures. Uh, but, you know, focused is good. <laughs> Close up is good. Um, the better your picture is, the more chance we'll have uh, in identifying what it is. But thank you, everybody. And I'm going to stop sharing here and see if we have any questions.